How are you doing? Uh, thanks for coming tonight. Um, I just first want to uh, acknowledge that uh, when patients are in chronic pain, it's not easy to get around. And uh, for you to make it tonight is, um, says a lot about your motivation to get better. I think that's 50% of already trying to uh, make amends with your pain. So um, as Ellie said, uh, my name is Dr. Kai McGreevy, for those that don't know me. Um, and uh, I am the medical director at McGreevy NeuroHealth, which is right down the road here. Um, I'm going to uh, also take a moment to just thank my staff uh, at McGreevy NeuroHealth. Um, they have, my father used to say, you're only as good as your staff, ultimately. And so I really want to acknowledge them um, because their hard work and dedication is really what makes our practice where it's at. I'm going to talk a little bit briefly before we get into pain um, about a place where I trained several years ago. Um, and this place is uh, called the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And I can boast and say, you know, this is a wonderful place and, and yada, yada, yada. But there's certain things that, um, that we uh, physicians that trained here all have in common and that is a patient-centered focus. Um, it sounds kind of cliche but it's actually quite true. Johns Hopkins was uh, deemed the top hospital, America's top hospital, for 21 straight years. This is in comparison to Mayo Clinic which you probably have heard of um, as well as Harvard, um, Massachusetts General Hospital, and so forth. And the reason for that mainly is because the culture at Johns Hopkins is to never leave a stone unturned. With pain in particular, it's not always so simple, is it? And so some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight are going to kind of map out why pain is so difficult to deal with, how important it is to um, stay on top of pain, and what types of treatments there are on the horizon that can offer other, other avenues to overcome your pain. So we're located uh, off International Golf Parkway, very close to where we are right here on the other side of 95. And, um, you're in a really good place, actually, as far as healthcare is concerned. Um, recently, there's been some publicity, and it indicates that the income level is an indicator of health. Well, I'm not so sure about that, but there was a, a ranking of St. John's County actually being one of the healthiest counties, and I think that part of that is access to healthcare. So, um, with that and the fact that, um, at least with our practice, we are really undergoing a revolution, so, so to speak, um, you're going to see a lot of good things come from this place. So tonight, um, the goal here is to really learn about chronic pain and understand its widespread impact. Um, we're going to know more about available treatment options and then give you a chance to determine if there are some other options to help manage your pain more effectively. Okay, so first we have to ask the basic question, and I think this is relevant to anyone here. What is pain? Um, pain is actually defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with tissue damage or threat to tissue damage. So what does that really mean? There's two very important words right here, and uh, sensory and emotional. There's actually two components to the, the pain signal. And ultimately, where does pain actually get realized? It's in the brain. Um, and so later, that'll become more relevant, but I think it's important to point out now that there are two sides to pain one that essentially tells you, hey, there's something wrong, and the other telling you, 
let's try to remove ourselves from whatever it is that's causing the pain. A few basic definitions here that I'd like to highlight are some types of pain. We have something that's called nociceptive pain. And nociceptive pain is just pain due to tissue injury. So in other words, if you have a broken leg, um, you have a fracture of the spine, um, any kind of crush injury, you're going to have your garden variety pain signal. That's a lot different and is treated differently than something that's called neuropathic pain. Neuropathic means nerve pain. And so the reason this is an important distinction is that in nociceptive pain, the nerves are just carrying the signal as a middleman and telling you, hey, there's something wrong in your right arm. But neuropathic pain the actual problem is in the nerve itself, okay? And the treatment, therefore, is going to be quite different. Later on, we'll discuss some treatments that are available that target nerve pain. Um, the other two definitions that I feel are important are acute pain, and then I'll get into chronic pain. So how many think that pain is a good thing? Any takers? <laughs> Probably not. Um, certain pain is good, right? Because primitively speaking, we need to experience pain in order to avoid certain potential threat, threats to our body. So you think of chest pain, for example, and the heart attack victim. If we didn't have chest pain, we would really have an issue. Um, if we had a heart attack, that could be life-ending, right? Um, the same concept, you know, you accidentally place your hand on a hot stove and instantly, or near instantly, you will remove that arm to um, avoid the problem. That's acute pain. It comes and it goes. Tissue injury subsides, it gets healed, and you go back to your usual. Chronic pain, on the other hand, is a completely different animal, okay? Chronic pain basically means that pain is persisting, even despite healing of the underlying problem. And this begs the question as to why would that happen? And there are many complicated answers to that, but ultimately, it's the signals that keep bombarding the brain because you have this continuous signal that's being sent from wherever the injury is and it has to travel to the brain. Eventually, the brain starts to reorganize that information. There's some studies that show that the brain can change. So if pain affects the brain and the brain is capable of changing, then we may have some avenues actually to take advantage of that. And I'll get into that a little bit later as well. So what is chronic pain? Generally speaking, it's uh, defined as uh, pain that persists for greater than six months. That's an arbitrary number, but that's what the literature essentially shows. That's what we commonly hold, okay? And the important thing about chronic pain is that it's usually neuropathic, meaning that it usually has nerve injury involved, and that it interrupts daily activity. It actually affects the functioning of the individual. So it's not just an annoyance. It's not just an aggravation. This is something that impairs your quality of life. Taking it a step further, chronic pain is actually a public health issue, a major health issue. Let's take the opioid epidemic and put that aside. Just pain alone is bigger than what most patients may feel or the general population, as well as physicians. We're really under-educated under about this problem. So pain affects more Americans than diabetes 
than heart disease and cancer combined. That right there kind of sets the picture of how serious this problem is. It's also cited as the most common reason Americans access the health system and therefore is extremely costly. And chronic pain is the most common cause of long-term disability, which is a bit intuitive. Let's take it a little bit further. How does pain affect the body? Okay, we understand that certain things will, in the body will cause you to have pain, but what does pain do to the rest of the body? Well, it's actually linked to a number of health problems. And this is enlightening to me, but at the same time, these are avenues for treatment potentially. Sometimes we can target the pain directly and we win. Sometimes we target the pain directly and we don't win. This begs the, the uh, importance of understanding the bigger picture of what's going on physiologically in the body and looking for other avenues to intervene. So here's an example. We have chronic pain and it can lead to a problem with something called the endocrine system, which is what creates hormones in our body. These are chemicals. The chemicals in our body that um, allow our organs to function smoothly. Obviously pain is a very stressful problem, not only psychologically, but also physiologically. In other words, how the body functions. It's linked to increased cortisol. Cortisol is one of the stress hormones that's really linked to high blood sugars. High blood sugars, that sounds familiar. High blood sugars is linked to so many medical problems. And we're only a few steps upstream from chronic pain to high blood sugar. And when that is chronic, can lead to obesity. Now obesity is linked to migraine, it's linked to heart disease, stroke, um, it's linked to something called insulin resistance, and ultimately diabetes. Diabetes by itself is linked to many of those things as well. So it's very important for us to pay attention and as we move forward in the world of pain management is my belief that we cannot just ignore the effects that pain has on other systems. What about the cardiovascular system? Well, it's intuitive. If you're in acute pain, kind of raises your blood pressure, your heart rate, got a bit of uh, what we call tachycardia, maybe a fight or flight response because you're trying to remove yourself from whatever it is that's causing that pain? Well, the same concept can be held for chronic pain. Same idea. Why is high blood pressure and sympathetic overdrive a problem? It can lead to really serious issues like heart attacks. Immune dysfunction. Chronic pain affects the immune system. In fact, everything affects the immune system technically, and the immune system affects just about everything else in the body. So this doesn't surprise me, but some may find that kind of interesting. You're more susceptible to infections when you have chronic pain because you're, we're really looking at an immunosuppressed state. If you can think of the part of the body that's responsible for responding to stress, and it's constantly being stressed, eventually there's no more hormone to fight or flight, right? To really react to the problem. The immune system then gets suppressed. It works the other way. Puts you at risk for having upper respiratory infections, urinary tract infections, pneumonia. These are serious issues that chronic pain can ultimately play a role. Obviously, you're going to have suppressed activity level if, if, 
if we're running into a lot of these health issues. So it's not just isolated as, well, here's pain, and it's just in this little box, right? It's actually pain plus everything else. The suppressed activity level, if we don't exercise, if we're not able to have a decent diet, it's only going to compound the issue that much further. How do we unwind some of our American habits, so to speak, right? This is, this is America, but these are serious issues, and I'm just trying to highlight the importance of, you know, the doctor says, well, you have to eat right, you have to exercise, yada, 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 but actually there's a, a bit of basis to it. Musculoskeletal dysfunction, what does that mean? Ultimately, it means that once you're in pain, you're going to guard. If my back is hurting me on the right side, the muscles are going to start to guard, and you're, gonna, you're developing something called fear avoidance. So you stop doing certain things. When you stop doing certain things, the body reacts. Suddenly, the body has to adjust, make compensation, and as a result, muscles get imbalanced. The muscles in the body act on opposing purposes. So some muscles cause one movement, and there's an antagonistic muscle, an opposite muscle, that does the opposite movement. And so if somebody is experiencing chronic pain, it's not uncommon that we see a lot of muscular imbalance, and by that alone, we experience more pain, less function. So certainly, when we don't use our muscles, what happens? The muscle starts to atrophy, stops working. It's just like building a muscle. You, you do exercise to build the muscle. Well, if the opposite can happen. If you don't use it, you lose it. And then lastly, Chronic pain is linked to serious problems. So not just physiological, but also neurological and psychiatric. And this is intuitive that when we're having chronic pain, just about every patient I've talked to about this says, I can't sleep. Now, take a step back. As the years go by, our quality of sleep decreases, actually, each decade, the quality of sleep gets worse and worse and worse. It sounds terrible, but it's actually true. There's studies that look at what we call deep sleep. We do uh, brainwave studies called EEG, and we see very little delta sleep, um, and we see that with just the aging process. Now, add chronic pain to that equation, and that accelerates. Sleep is fragmented. Sleep initiation is difficult. Maintenance of sleep. Wait, abrupt awakenings. Things like sleep apnea develop. And so there are a lot of issues where pain leads to sleep disorders. Conversely, sleep disorders can lead to pain. And the reason for that is because your brain operates on a cycle. It wants routine. My migraine patients, I always preach to them how important it is to have a routine life. You have to have a boring life if you have migraine. Because essentially, you have to eat at the same time every day. You go to sleep at the same time every day. You have to wake up at the same time every day to essentially the minute because the brain craves that routine. Well, if I've got sleep fragmentation, that's going to really impair my ability to recover and for the body to heal. Cognitive dysfunction. Let's think about that for a moment. Again, as the years go by, yes, we can forget, be forgetful, right? Um, we can have a little difficulty with being able to find places that we're familiar, maybe, or to come up with the right words. It can be something simple. You add chronic pain to that equation, 
the studies are now showing that there's an increased risk of dementia. There's an increased risk of um, other neurological syndromes that may not be qualified as dementia, but can be called mild cognitive impairment. Okay, and so these are really serious considerations. And further, this is important because the earlier you detect this kind of a problem, the earlier you should intervene. Okay. To my knowledge, there hasn't been a study that says if you treat the chronic pain effectively, that the cognition gets better. However, intuitively, that would, I would expect something along those lines. Here's a biggie, anxiety and depression. Which came first, the chicken or the egg, right? Sometimes the anxiety gets your heart rate up and, and um, you kind of almost go into fight or flight mode well, that just accelerates the pain behavior and the experience. So sometimes we will have a, a real physiological pain problem, but then the anxiety really amplifies that pain. And if the anxiety is not treated or at least addressed to a degree, it may be so difficult to catch the pain. It's almost like it's getting away from you. You feel like you lose control. And most of the anxiety disorders are based on the notion that we've lost control of whatever it is that we fear. Depression is huge. Um, chronic pain and depression really go hand in hand. And a lot of folks won't admit to it. Um, and I can understand that. But the fact of the matter is, if the depression is not addressed, if you don't have control over your problem, then it's going to be that much bigger of an issue. So that's really meant to just highlight or enlighten you if you haven't thought about these things, because it enlightens me to think about these things. And I see it every day. So as pain management, the field goes forward, we're gonna to have to pay attention to these things. Primary care, their job is to deal with a lot of these issues, but if they don't see it and you don't bring it up, you may not even recognize some of these things that as, as the patient, someone has to come and figure it out, right? Someone has to step in. So move on to the next slide here. So this is just, everything that I just said in a diagram, so I'm not gonna go over it again, but I did place pain in the middle or in the center because I just want to emphasize that there's a bi-directionality of pain and its effect on the human body and mind. It goes both ways. Lastly, uh, the chronic pain, its negative impact on qu the quality of life I'll stop right there. The quality of life here is the biggest thing, okay? If we can have a better quality of life and still deal with some pain, that's better than having, you know, pain and, and, and a reduced quality of life. I think that's really the, the importance here. But the negative impact that chronic pain has on quality of life is more severe than things like heart failure, renal failure or kidney failure, major depression, and is equal or close to equal to terminal cancer. Obviously, this is a serious problem. So a moment for you to maybe reflect a little bit if you're experiencing chronic pain or you're a loved one of somebody who has chronic pain and you're here, um, just think briefly about how long you've been dealing with that. We said six months is kind of that minimum time frame. And what are we doing now to manage the pain? And how well has it been working?
And some of you may be feeling like this to a degree, at some level. Kind of lost at sea. What's going on? Why can't I get my pain under control? Why can't my doctors seem to feel like that they can get your pain under control? It's an extremely difficult place to be. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some treatment options. Okay, and I'm actually going to go back to the basics first and then get to the high-tech kind of stuff. Okay. But the bottom line that I want to convey from here going to the rest of the talk is you have to be in control. If you don't feel like you have a game plan and you don't have control, it's going to be very difficult to be able to overcome the problem. The other important point here is that not every treatment is the same for everybody for the same condition. Everybody's different. Everybody's physiology is different. Their mind is different. Everybody, that's what makes us all unique. So the treatments that are available have to be tailored to the individual. All right, so we're gonna start with I went to the primary care because I had sciatica and back pain, and they sent me to physical therapy, very first thing. And nine times out of 10, by the time they get to me or a pain physician, I've had physical therapy numbers of times, over and over and over, and I just hurt more. It's what I hear all the time. It must be true. But let's take a step back. Physical therapy is a little bit misunderstood. We want the immediate gratification of relief. Totally get that. But physical therapy really is not so focused on your pain. That's, a, that's kind of downstream. They're really focused on restoring function. And sometimes, in order from for someone to get from here to there, they actually have to go through pain in order to get there. And that's not easily acceptable for people who experience this. Initially, the muscles will wake up when you undergo physical therapy, right? All of a sudden, my therapist is telling me, I've got to do this, what? And certain muscle groups suddenly may not have been activated for over 10, 20 years, and suddenly we're asking them to do something that doesn't feel natural, but ultimately is necessary to restore the function of that joint or to restore function of that muscle group. And so with education, I really think that physical therapy has a place, not necessarily to lessen pain, although ultimately that's the goal, but to improve the function of that particular part of the body. Counseling and complementary alternative medicine, we call it CAM, C-A-M. So this is really underutilized, and this is a part, part, in part maybe a failure of the healthcare system as we know it. And what I mean by that is insurance coverage plans for mental health is really, really poor in many instances. Here we are just explaining how important it is to treat anxiety and depression and these things that really play into the chronic pain experience. But can we have some help financially, you know, in order to be able to achieve that? It's a tough situation these days, but it's important to manage stress, pain, anxiety, depression. Coping strategies. We do actually have mental health experts that are taught and have board exams on coping strategies for pain to apply something called cognitive behavioral therapy. I'm not talking about throwing Lexapro at your depression or anxiety. I'm really talking about being able to talk 
talk about your pain, how it is really affecting you, and all the other parts of your life. I think it's important not to seal it in, because at some point, someone's got to listen, right? Someone's, someone's got to see what's going on. You hold it in, it's, it's going to be a really tough road. So I do favor these things, and I think that they're underutilized. Um, maybe some of you have tried massage, meditation, acupuncture. Um, there is something that's called biofeedback, which I, as a neurologist, feel that there is potential there for the future of pain management. We'll get into a little bit of that later. So now we're on the medications. And I'm not going to spend too much time on this because while it's admirable that the FDA has been able to approve 14 years of researched medications and get them on the market, how it affects you as the individual is different than how perhaps the clinical trial was set up. Okay. So medications often have this problem here, side effects, side effects, and side effects. And that's the frustrating part, because it would be so easy to just have a, the magic pill, right? The body is too complicated to have a magic pill. Opioids, big epidemic going on, right? That's actually nothing terribly new. It is new to the CDC, the federal government. This problem has been around for years. And unfortunately, physicians have not been educated properly in medical school. And it's been a learning process for me as a pain physician. So now the tides have turned. Ten years ago, opioids were great. You could throw it in the water, and, and it, it, it treats your pain. Everybody's happy. Now we're seeing the negative effect of that. Um, and it's a real issue. So whatever we can do to de-emphasize this and to emphasize other alternative treatments, I think that's where we need to get. Some of you have tried this. Sometimes we win, but a lot of times we don't win, not with certain treatments. The epidural has been around for years. The anesthesiologists were smart because they're in the operating room and they have to make sure that their patients are comfortable. And so they devoted their lives to keeping patients comfortable. Do they always, are they always able to, to uh, realize that? Not necessarily, but they're the experts when it comes to these things. So the epidural was derived from anesthesiologists. And at the end of the day, if you have chronic pain, we may get three to four months. So if some are lucky, we'll get six months, maybe, maybe a little bit more than that. But as time goes on, we're exposing Steroid, for example. Now, steroids have a bad rap in general, and there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about it, in my opinion. But that being said, do we want to add more fuel to the fire, necessarily? We have to weigh each individual's risks versus benefits and see if that makes sense. There are other treatments, nerve blocks, radiofrequency ablation. These are things that we do in our practice, and it, we try to tailor it to the right patient at the right time. And many times, we're capable of managing the pain. It was difficult to really get rid of the pain on a 24-7 basis so I can function better and really get on with life. Some of us are like, well, geez. What else is there? You know, should I just go to have surgery? Can't they just fix it, right? Can't, can't the surgeons just fix this darn thing? You 
Here's a problem with surgery, and I'm going to preface this by saying that neurosurgeons have the most rigorous training in the whole residency fellowship of all the surgeons. They don't go home, they don't sleep, they operate. And then when they're about to get lunch, they operate. When they're about to go to sleep, they operate. And that is just the way life is for a neurosurgeon. And with that, there are a lot of great neurosurgeons. Someone has probably heard of Ben Carson here, I would imagine. And um, he actually trained and taught at Hopkins when I was there. And pretty phenomenal individual to be able to get to, not only to be able to be the first surgeon to unjoin, conjoin twins at the level of the brain, right? But then to run for office. I think that's pretty remarkable. There are amazing people. Surgery, though, sometimes lacks, okay? They can correct the underlying problem oftentimes. Does that mean that the pain will go away? Does that mean that functioning gets better? Not necessarily. In some cases, yes. If there's a discrete disc herniation, just one disc, not with other discs that are degenerated or flattened or bulging, just one disc that's herniated, pinching a nerve root, and it's causing the perfect picture of pain shooting down into the leg, and it's within the first three months of its onset, and the neurosurgeon gets to it, treats it, bye-bye pain. But if that pain has persisted longer, or the picture is a little more muddy, we've got arthritis, we've got spinal stenosis, we've got neuropathy, we've got a lot of these other things, suddenly surgery and its, its effect ultimately lower and lower and lower. So I hear this a lot. Great, my back is fixed, supposedly, but I'm still having pain. There's a lot of reasons for that, as I explained. Um, but I think one of the, the big, big things here is something called post-laminectomy pain syndrome or failed back surgical syndrome. Okay. Once you have a fusion, some of us may have a fusion. The uh, areas above the fusion, the areas below the fusion have to work harder because they're taking the load. All those years where L4, L5 was taking the load, suddenly that's stabilized. That's not going anywhere. But the level above at L3, 4 now is the old L4, 5. So it's important for us to really see, well, how far down the line do we really want to go when we are talking about surgery? And the answer to that is, you got to ask somebody who, who knows, you know, who really tries to isolate that problem. Surgery is not without risk. Um, that goes without saying. So if we're at risk for infection, if we have certain conditions, if we're on chemotherapy um, and we're immunocompromised, if we have diabetes, if we're tobacco users, this increases. And it's not unlikely that if you had a large surgery and you have some of those factors that there isn't going to be some complication that requires further surgery. And each time the scalpel gets to, the, to that area, the more adhesions form, the more problems. So a lot of us say, well, okay, all right, I've tried all that you just talked about, and then what? So 
I'm going to take a moment to talk about some more cutting edge treatments that are out there. One is called spinal cord stimulation, and then there will be a few others that are down the pike that you may not have heard of if you have already heard of spinal cord stim. This is a booming technology right now. So spinal cord stimulation, I would say, is where it's at, especially if you have nerve pain or neuropathic pain, or if you've had post-laminectomy or post-surgical pain. You've already had a fusion. Um, and that's a large population of folks, right? Spinal cord stimulation gives you the opportunity to have 24-7 coverage of the pain. Doesn't mean that it's going to be 100% gone and I'm back to 21. But it does mean that you have more control. You literally have it in your, in your hand. So I'll get into this in a little bit.